pass it to Matt. And Matt will start with uh, the process of his first question. And then uh, Ambassador Limbrell will have about 15, 20 minutes for his opening remark. And afterward, we will go to the audience for a conversation on the topic. Uh, many of you are familiar with the name of Ambassador John Limbrell. He is a fluent Persian speaker, one of the few American diplomats who has been an observer of Iran for more than 50 years. And he has had a distinguished record in the State Department. He served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Iran. And before that, he, is, uh, he was an international affairs professor, a distinguished professor at US Naval Academy. And prior to this, he has had numerous positions in the State Department and was one of the senior diplomats in Iran in 79, 80, when the American embassy was ransacked by the Iranian revolutionaries. And before the revolution also, John was a senior diplomat inside Iran. He has a, a resume that includes Peace Corps in Iran. I think he, he was a Peace Corps officer in Sanandaj, I believe. And he is also one of the few American diplomats who has a resume of teaching in Iran. And he taught at Shiraz University and also maybe at the high schools in Iran. Did you teach at a high school in Iran? Yeah. Well, so you're very, you're very delighted to kind of have you as our first conversation series on the U.S.-Iran relations. And I want to bring the attention of our audience to his book, Negotiating with Iran an excellent book about how the dynamics of negotiation between US and Iran is influenced by various cultural, social, international and political dynamics. So today's moderator for our session is Professor Matthew Shannon. And he was our first speaker on American connections with Iran. So Matt, go ahead, you can take it from here. Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be here. It's a privilege any time we have a chance to uh, talk to Ambassador Limbert about Iran, U.S.-Iran relations, or uh, uh, in any other range of sub subjects. So just uh, thank you. And I would also point out that I, if I understand correctly, uh, there's a, a, a novel uh, out, Believers, Love and Death in Tehran. And I just would kind of acknowledge this uh, recent publication that uh, should be on all of our shelves. Um, but my question um, is this, and it's a broad question, and hopefully it will set the stage for both your uh, talk and the Q&A that, that follows. Um, I'm just wondering, as I'm uh, kind of here in 2021, having deja vu to maybe 2009, when there was an, a conversation about kind of restarting uh, the U.S.-Iran relationship, and I'm wondering if um, this kind of rollover and change of policy uh, objectives from administration to administration or party to party is something unique to U.S.-Iran relations? Is it something that is unique to the U.S.-Iran relationship that it's so embedded in our uh, kind of politics that if there's a new administration, there's a new set of questions and a new agenda? Or from your experience serving as a diplomat in a, a range of uh, um, nations and in a range of capacities, is this just something that's inherent to uh, democracies and it's the messy business of uh, formulating a democratic foreign policy? Um, and that's just my basic question to get us started. Okay, thank you, Matt. Uh, thank you, Matt, and thank you, Bahman. And Bahman, thank you for, for all of that flattery. You know, it always works uh, <laughs> with, with me. And if you, so if you want to keep it up, if you wanted to go on for another five or 10 minutes, that would have been fine. To, uh, that would have been fine too. Um, we thank the Baskerville Institute. They, they, they've had some uh, wonderful programs. I'm really uh, honored to follow uh, Matt with his recent program and Hussein Shahabi with his, uh, his recent uh, program. Uh, so, uh, and a lot of people, I mean, don't know uh, that although we and the Iranians have been um, estranged now for 40 years, they think that's the norm. And they think that's the, that's the way it's always been. Um, that's really an aberration. You go back farther and you go back and look at people like uh, Baskerville and other uh, 
and others, um, the relationship has been very, di uh, very different. But we've been stuck in this um, hostility uh, for 40 years and longer than I ever thought we would be. Um, and it's proved very difficult to get out of it. Well, I'd like to talk about sort of the talk for about 20 minutes about um, the way forward and what we might expect and what might um, and what might work. Let me start uh, with the obvious, uh, and that is that we we in the Islamic Republic have been um, locked in a struggle um, of hostility for 40 years since since 1979. Uh, and it's as though we have two, two parties standing on opposite sides of an abyss. And across that abyss, uh, the only way they can communicate is by shouting insults and accusations and threats to each other. And from the U.S. point of view, again, I'm restating the obvious, um, those 40 years of insults and hostility have essentially accomplished nothing. I mean, whatever goal we've had, essentially nothing has worked. We've talked, we've had dual containment, we've had the axis of evil. Uh, more recently, we've had maximum pressure. Um, all these things have turned out to be hollow slogans uh, that have yielded nothing. The Islamic Republic survives uh, and remains, uh, remains hostile. Um, it has been a problem for uh, successive administrations, uh, which have sometimes sworn at the beginning that they were not going to touch Iran, but uh, they found they couldn't, uh, they couldn't do it. Um, the Islamic Republic destroyed President Carter's uh, administrative presidency and his presidency and almost did the same with um, his, success his successor. Now, I'll start with some personal notes. Uh, and note, as I think uh, uh, Professor Bakhtiari did, uh, my own personal connection it goes back about uh, it goes back about fifty years, uh, long before I even joined the Foreign Service, uh, as as a teacher, uh, a scholar, um, a, uh, a, tour, a, a tourist, and briefly a diplom briefly a, a diplomat, and then a prisoner, and then a, and then a prisoner. Uh, but always been involved in one way, one way or another for a long time. Um, also, I, in the interest of full disclosure, um, I make no effort to hide the fact that I don't like the Islamic Republic very much. It's not a place um, that I would prefer, a system that I would prefer to live under, nor um, would I, do I want to see some, that for my Iranian uh, friends and, and family. They deserve something better. They deserve some uh, system that uh, treats them treats them decently and doesn't throw them in jail for um, asking inconvenient questions. But again, my personal views, I think, are irrelevant because um, I also want to see some different kind of relationship that would benefit both sides. As forty year forty years of estrangement um, has clearly not been beneficial. Um, but such an attitude, I would also say, I would also note, uh, has not earned me a lot of friends. Um, some of the not one of the nicer things um, I'm called is the Manchurian candidate, is the Manchurian candidate, uh, as someone brainwashed uh, as a, as a as a prisoner. I would also note that um, on the matter of Iran, particularly in the matter of prediction. Uh, and I'm going to, you, you, I'm probably going to stay away as much as I can from prediction because I've been wrong a lot. Um, maybe if you deal with Iran, that's something you have to accept that you are going to be wrong a lot. I mean, I did not think that the revolution would go in the very harsh um, direction that it would. Um, I did not think that Iran and the United States would remain hostile for for so long, but I was wrong. And what I've discovered along the way that actually uh, to be an Iran expert um, is not very complicated, it's not very difficult. Uh, basically, you have to be able to say two things. One is um, it's very complicated that you can say, and the other is simply, I don't know. 
And if you say those two things, uh, you cover about 90% of the question. But let me uh, quote a good Foreign friend and Foreign Service colleague, Ambassador Ryan Crocker, who once in talking about, I remember he was talking about Iran or the Middle East in general, but it certainly applies to Iran. He said, uh, everything uh, takes longer than you think. Everything you want to do is harder than you think. And whenever you think you're making progress, some something or someone will come along and screw it up. And that's certainly been the case over uh, the last 40 years. And I'll end this introduction just with a story to maybe illustrate that point, illustrate that point. Uh, going back to 1979, um, this was when um, our, I was in the, uh, an officer, political officer at the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. And believe it or not, we had an embassy. <laughs> we had an embassy there, an operating embassy until uh, November 4th. So this was in about September. Um, and our mission was to establish some kind of relationship with whatever system, whatever reality uh, was going to replace the monarchy. It was clear the monarchy had fallen um, eight or eight, seven, eight months earlier. Um, and we didn't know quite, no one quite knew what was going to replace it. But uh, U.S. interests and our instructions were uh, do what you can to keep a relationship uh, going because this is an important, this is a very important country for us, whoever, whatever system rules. So um, I learned uh, that a senior Iranian clergyman, uh, wa uh, a man of great respect and influence, was going to be traveling to Chicago uh, for medical treatment. We had given him a visa, which was no small thing in those days. Um, and so I, I called the foreign ministry and spoke to a person there. And I, I said, I understand that this, His Excellency is traveling uh, to Chicago and we would like to help him um, at the airport to ease his way through uh, customs and immigration so that he has no problem, so that um, he has no problem. Uh, could you please let me know his uh, arrival plans. And the man, there was a silence for a minute, and basically the person told me to buzz off. Um, that that was no business of mine. Uh, uh, that was no business of mine. So as the Iranians say, be a hubikon. Um, you try to do something good, um, it comes back to to, to get you. Obviously, uh, he didn't want any, any part of our help. He didn't want anything uh, to do with it. And to me, that was uh, sort of illustrative of where we've been uh, over the last 40 years. So um, how do we go forward? What do we do? What do we do now? Well, uh, I've noticed that, I mean, the Biden administration is getting uh, advice from all quarters. And I, I really don't have a lot of wisdom saying they should, day one, they should do this, or day two, they should do that. These are more issues of principle. How do you, you know, what will, what might work in a, difficult relationship like that. Um, uh, some of these things sound obvious, but they've been difficult in the past. For example, uh, one of the first thing you have to do is you have to have a goal. You have to know what you want. Um, to quote uh, the Cheshire, uh, Lewis Carroll's Cheshire Cat, um, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. So, where do you, what do you want? So make a list. So, and not only what, what do you, what do we want, but what's the other side want? So we take a page from uh, Richard Nixon's book. Now I'm not a great admirer of Richard Nixon, but um, he, when he went to China, he took a yellow pad, uh, drew a line down the middle. And on one side he wrote, he listed what we want. Um, and on the other side, he listed what they want. Um, and so Figure out what do you want? What does the other side want? Now, I, I, when I started doing this, I came up with a long list of goals for both sides. So I'll just mention a few that, again, are, shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. For I mean, what would be the U.S. goals would be 
Um, no Iranian uh, nuclear weapons or nuclear weapons program. Uh, limit support or limit or end Iran's support for terrorism. Avoid a U.S.-Iran um, armed conflict. Um, limit Iran's activities against U.S. friends uh, in the region. And there are others, but those are some of the more maybe at the top of the list. Uh, on the Iranian side, again, I, I, the list turned out to be pretty long, but uh, here are three or four at the top are uh, first, the uh, survival of the Islamic Republic, uh, defend the homeland, no division of the country uh, along ethnic or linguistic lines, uh, and end foreign support for um, anti um, Islamic Republic groups. There are a lot of others, obviously, sell, for example, rebuild the economy, sell oil, be able to sell oil at market prices, and so forth. But those are those are a few. Now, okay, so you know where you want to go. Then the question is, how do you get there? Uh, then that's clearly the hard part. Um, first of all, at least from my experience, uh, changing an approach that you've had for 40 years, whether it's been uh, effective or not, is very hard. Uh, because for better or worse, it's, it's what both sides know how to do. What both sides know how to do very well is to bash each other, to call each other's, uh, uh, to, to call each other names. Uh, but they don't, they really don't know anything. They really don't know anything else or anything else is, is, turns out to be, um, unfamiliar, uncharted territory. Um, what else you could, the other thing you could do, and again, uh, I don't think I'm, for this group, I'm saying anything that's very surprising, is to use the tools of, nego use the tools of negotiation. Uh, listening, forbearance, patience, uh, and empathy. And be prepared for rejection, setbacks, um, and delays. Don't give up um, at the first setback, because unfortunately, that has too often been the pattern. Um, focus on the goals and not on the immediate uh, events. Um, the, you, both the Iranians are going to sometimes say things, they're going to do things, they're going to move a few boats around from here to there, they're going to, the parliament is going to make some hostile statements, some official uh, is going to say something, is going to say something, don't over, don't re, overreact to every one of these um, uh, of these events. Uh, stay focused on the goal. Um, a military friend of mine once said, and I've often used this. He said, "Remember, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing." And so, whatever your main thing is in Iran uh, with Iran, keep it that way and don't get distracted. Uh, another way, another uh, thing, well, way to move ahead is to tone down the rhetoric. Uh, watch out for the chest beating. Uh, watch out for uh, the uh, uh, feel good kind of statement, the, what uh, the, righteous ind the righteous indignation. Choose Choose one, one's words carefully. Now, to and a group with the, this group, with all the experience, again, this seems obvious, but we haven't seen much of this um, over the past four years. Uh, and beware of the easy phrase that sometimes it might sound profound, uh, but actually misleads. Things like um, Iranian threats. So, uh, what does that mean? Uh, malign behavior. Uh, new Persian, new Persian Empire, um, Iranian hegemony, uh, phrases like this, which, you know, which may sound good, they may sound kind of they, they meaningful, but if you look into them, they really don't further the conversation. Um, and also, again, avoid, uh, avoid sermonizing to say, well, uh, if, uh, if Iran wants uh, a better relationship, it must do X, um, X, Y, and Z. It must uh, change its beha change its behavior. That's been one of my hobby horses.
one of my hobby horses. And I found it's very, that phrase, change its behavior or change their behavior, uh, it remains very persistent. Um, so remember, and remember there, there are some basics about Iran that uh, people, should re people should remember. Uh, that based on their history, Iranians see themselves besieged by enemies who want to seize their territory and overthrow their, uh, overthrow their government. Um, and from the Iranian point of view, most, um, the U.S. was not neutral during the Iran-Iraq war. The U.S. aligned itself with Saddam, with a deadly enemy doing horrible damage to, uh, to Iran. The other thing to remember um, is that those who hold power today uh, in the Islamic Republic, uh, I think they know they're not very popular. Uh, I mean, it's been the same aging clique um, uh, of, man, of, of men, uh, now old men, um, that has held power since 1979. And it will, it has, and will do whatever, uh, whatever it must to stay in power. Now, of course, we here in the United States um, are quite familiar, have become quite familiar with people who will do anything to stay in power, and who simply don't want to leave, uh, uh, um, don't want to get, uh, give it up. Uh, but in Iran, this group has been around since 19, 1979. Um, my good friend and colleague, uh, Karim Sajakpur, used to say about this group, they said its average age now is deceased. Uh, but they're still actually, there's some of them are still here. Uh, but there, at, at the same time, there's this widening gap between this rather ossified group, um, which stays in power Based on, uh, largely by often by largely by brute force, and a well-educated, uh, very uh, very savvy, well-connected uh, population uh, population. Another basic is that this mistrust between the U.S. and Iran runs deep. Um, I refer you back to my original story about wanting um, a. Uh, a clergyman's arrival information in Chicago, which was I was not too politely told was none of my uh, uh, was none of my business. Um, and statements statements of support coming out of a of, a, of an administration um, about statements of support for the Iranian people, frankly, will not be believed um, as long as these same people are subject to uh, travel uh, uh, travel bans. Uh, border harassment and uh, so-called maximum pressure campaigns. One last thing, and then I'd uh, love to go into to hear your comments and questions. And that is one last thing to remember, and that that is um, Iranian politics are for Iranians. I mean, I personally would love to see a different kind of government there. Uh, one that, as I said, treats its citizens decently, that doesn't throw uh, intellectuals, political activists, uh, women's rights activists, human rights activists, environmentalists, dual nationals, doesn't throw these people in, ja uh, in jail. Uh, but the uh, U.S., we're, we're not in a position to meddle to influence outcomes in favor of this faction or that faction. We should have learned by now. I mean, I personally served two tours uh, in Iraq after the 2003 invasion. And I saw for myself, uh, I saw for myself that this meddling, however well-intentioned it might have been, uh, is never going to end well. Well, thank you for your attention. Let me let me end there, and I'd very much uh, like to hear your comments and questions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, John, for that introduction and really summarizing 40 plus years of 
what we have called mutual demonization, um, isolation kind of a, is very important because it prevents us, this type of uh, mutual demonization prevents us from realizing the cultural connection, the friendship connections between Americans and Iranians that go back, as Matt knows and you know, to late 19th century and even today, Many Americans do not know how many Americans are buried in Iran in terms of this lifetime services they did to Iran in Urumia, in Tabriz and so forth like that. So really appreciate that context that you put it in. I wanna start with one historical question and then I'm asking the audience to please send their questions in on the question and answer chapter. As you know, January 16, is an important date in Iran, January 16, 1979. That's the date the Shah of Iran was forced to leave Iran. That's actually this week. He left Iran uh, without his kind of will. He actually had tears in his eyes. He kind of kissed the airport tarmac, if I recall, and he got on his plane and left, left the country. You were at the embassy at that time. How did American diplomats view that phase, that period of the Iranian revolution? Did they see the Iranian revolution as inevitable? Did they look at the whole process of revolution unfolding in Iran, let's say from January 1978 to January 1979? The fast pace, did that surprise diplomats how the Shah of Iran was so quickly uh, packed up and forced out. I mean, could you give us some observations about how you were seeing the events in Iran at that time? Okay, first of all, Bahman, uh, you give me more credit than I deserve. I, I came, uh, although I had lived in Iran before, I came to the embassy with a, uh, in August of 1979. I see. I got there late in the day, six, six months after the actual revolution, six months at, after, the re, after the revolution. Mm -hmm. um, some people could say my timing was uh, uh, pretty terrible since we only, I only lasted on the streets about 12 weeks after, uh, from that date. Um, but you can go back the, uh, you know, courtesy of our friends, the Danish Julian uh, Peroi Khate Imam, the student follower of the occupiers, uh, of the embassy, there are about 70 or 80 volumes of uh, Iranian, of um, uh, American diplomatic correspondence that fell into their hands. Uh, and they've done historians a great service by collecting it and publishing, uh, uh, um, and publishing. And you can read exactly, you know, all of this diplomatic um, uh, correspondence. Uh, and my short answer is um, the revolution and the, the rapidity of it, the, the speed of the of, of the collapse um, of the monarchy, um, surprised everybody. I think it's both Amer both foreigners and Iranian uh, uh, and and Iranians. I mean, had you if you looked at Iran, let's say in late 1977, when President Carter went there, you remember, and he made his famous. Uh, toast about the island of stability, about the uh, uh, about Iran and the island of stability. Uh, if you looked at Iran then, uh, and you didn't know that the Shah had been diagnosed with cancer in 1974, I mean, uh, the, the three over three years earlier, uh, you would think, uh, yeah, this place is, is it's pretty it's pretty stable. Um, yeah, sure, there are problems, but there, are, there, there always have been. But you look at the production of oil, you look at the direction, the foreign policy, Iran didn't have any enemies. Um, and so I, th I think it was the British ambassador at the time, was it Ambassador Parsons? Yes. Who once said, he said, in, 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 if, if at that time I had predicted, you know, that in a year um, the Shah was, would be gone, and he would be replaced by uh, a 70 some year old clergyman, an elderly clergyman, a uh, 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 cleric, uh, my government would have psychobacked me. Uh, they would have sent me to a psychiatric hospital and they would have been right to do so. Um, and at least as far as I know, um, very few people 
uh, e either Iranian or non-Iranian uh, uh, predicted the course of uh, 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 predicted the course of events. Uh, not knowing the Shah's illness was one of the factors, but there were other there there were, there were others as well. Now, of course, uh, we can talk about this, but uh, many of my uh, Iranian American friends uh, say, well. In that case, the only explanation was that um, President Carter, the British, the Israelis, the French, and others all got together and decided that the Shah had to go. Because what other possible explanation could there be? Yeah, it's a, it is a kind of a interesting phase of uh, when during the Shah's regime, Americans could not think anything negative happening inside Iran because of that positive relation that you mentioned. And today we are in an unfortunate situation that because of the acrimony, we cannot think of anything positive happening inside Iran. It's true. So <laughs> uh, with that, I will go to Matt and start uh, bringing up the questions. The questions keep coming in right now, John. And so Matt, go ahead. Uh, if you could bring up the questions that we are receiving now. And yeah, we have some wonderful questions and some of them fit pretty well together. Um, one question, um, I believe this is from Randall Paul. Um, he's noted that in the Nixon list that you kind of put together for us, that there were a lot of no's, a lot of negative points um, on that list. And he was wondering if there are positives or kind of proactive measures that you uh, would add to that list. This reminds me of um, the Cold War debates in the 60s when there was a critique of the Eisenhower administration for having a kind of a negative policy, being anti-communist or anti-this, but not being for something. This was a critique that the Kennedys made of, of Eisenhower. And so he's wondering what the, the positive um, kind of trust building elements of this list might be. And just to hitch that to another question, how would you communicate these positive elements in, say, a State of the Union speech so that kind of the intentions of the new administration could be clearly communicated in a way that was more productive than, say, in State of the Union speeches in the early 2000s? Okay, hey, good. Uh, that, that's a good point, actually. You know, I, I, I had, uh, I think I listed about four um, four goals on each, uh, on each side. I had actually written down seven or eight, but in the interest of time, I just cut them down, cut them down. And it turned out that the negatives were, were at the top. Um, the, the questioner is quite right, is quite right to, no, to notice that. But there, there, I mean, for example, uh, a U.S. goal would be to ensure, uh, free passage of commerce, uh, and oil to and from the Persian Gulf. Um, Another would be uh, release of American citizen and dual national prisoners uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in Iran. Another would be um, observations of basic human rights according to the United Nations International Declaration of Human Rights. This is not a matter of imposing one value or another. This is, these are universal, stand, um, uh, universal standards. Um, on the Iranian side, perhaps, uh, you know, the, the major one would be selling, be the ability to sell oil at market, uh, freely at, uh, and at market prices, um, and the ability to then rebuild the, uh, uh, uh rebuild the economy. Uh, these are some positive, posi uh, uh, definitely some, some positive things, but you're right. Um, unfortunately, there are at least a lot of these things are negative, not, you know, over, you could you can turn it around. I mean, when I said avoiding uh, no division of the country, maybe that's maintaining territorial integrity. It's another way of put it um, uh, of putting that because that's been a particular that's been a particularly sensitive issue um, for Iran for a long time. Whether it's uh, whether it's been a, the Islamic Republic or um, uh, or the monarch uh, um, or the monarchy. Uh, because the, we all know the we all know the history of how of, of what's happened and how Iran lost um, over the over the centuries uh, some of its most some of its most important 
possession, pieces of uh, pieces of territory, uh, pieces of territory. How to convey this? That's that's a terrific question. I I don't really have a have a good answer, but you you do it as often as you can, and in as many channels as you can. I mean, President Obama did it from his in his inauguration. Uh, 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 in his inauguration speech. He did it in his first uh, no news greeting, New Year's greetings in March of 2009 when he spoke about um, greetings to the Iranian people and to the government of the Islamic Republic of Iran. This, is, this was new. This was different. Um, he mentioned it in his uh, Nobel Peace Prize acceptance when he talked about engaging with repressive uh, regime, which he said lacks the satisfying purity of indignation. Uh, indignation. And the point is, you don't do it just once. Uh, it isn't one speech. Uh, it isn't one message. Um, it's the willingness to continue and the willingness to follow it by policy. In other words, the first time that it doesn't work, or the first time you don't get the response that you want, um, you don't give up. You keep after uh, 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 you keep after it because there is this depth of mistrust. I mean, the first reaction is it's always going to be, um, "What do they mean by that? What's the trick? What trick is there?" And so you 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 keep at it. Um, you keep go, uh, um, uh, you keep going. I mean, I I noticed, for example, uh, after two thousand nine, when President Obama made his his outreach, um, it seemed to me that the Iranians were caught uh, wrong footed, and they didn't know how to respond. They did not know how to respond, and you had a whole period, three or four years, of sort of no response. Uh, no response. It just had nothing to say. And it wasn't really until 2013, for really four years in the four years into the um, Obama time and his second administration that you began to see uh, some positive movement. Excellent. So let me ask, uh, uh, I think Matt is putting together the questions of after the revolution. I'm, I'm trying to kind of help with the questions that are coming in about your observations of Iran before the revolution. So there was, uh, I think Reverend John Chain asked the question about, uh, can you speak about the role of Savak and the repressive violent role in keeping the Shah in power? And the way those in Iran who felt that the Shah's leadership was being propped up by the United States and enforced by Savak. Mm -hmm. You know that that was uh, that was one of those things. I, again, I can't speak specifically to you know what Savak was was or was not doing, but anyone who lived who was there uh, in the sixties and seventies, it was clearly a presence and clearly um, um, and clearly important. Uh, so that, for example, I, I I was there. I was in Iran in October of nineteen sixty four. Uh, at the time that um, Ayatollah Khomeini spoke out um, against the new status of forces agreement that he called, you know, a new version of capitulation, a new version of, cap uh, of capitulation, which gave certain, expanded the immunities available to um, American military advisors, uh, American military advisors. Um, and the, um, he spoke out he spoke out very strongly against it, and in response, the Shah arrested him and sent him into exile. Uh, sent him into exile. I think this was in October of '64. I was there. I was in. Uh, I was in uh, Sanandaj actually at the time, teaching. I didn't know anything about it. Nothing. Hmm. There was no discussion of it. There was nothing. Certainly nothing in the news. Um, or at least nothing in the news that I had access to, and no one in front of me would talk about it. 
Um, I don't know if people talked about spoke about it among themselves, but people were very careful. That was the that was the atmosphere. That was the atmosphere. Uh, and these were, you know, these these were decisive events. If you go back and you trace the history uh, of what, you know, of, under the monarchy and what led up to the revolu- uh, revolution, that whole controversy over the status of forces agreement and, uh, really is uh, uh, it becomes a decisive uh, decisive turning point, um, and really gave um, Ayatollah Khomeini his start, if you like, as a nationalist leader, as a uh, um, as a nationalist leader. Uh, but there I was. I didn't know anything about it. No one spoke. No one. Uh, uh, no one talked about it. Um, and this perception of this perception of uh, the Shah as being dependent on foreigners. Particularly the the Americans, um, that was very persistent. That was everywhere, um, and you know it was one of those things. It's kind of like Monty Python. You know, remember the Monty Python skit where you know only the Messiah would say that he's not the Messiah. Um, uh, this was it was a little bit that uh, was a little bit that way. Uh, so that in 1965, when when the Shah, uh, when the Iranians and the Soviets signed the agreement uh, for the steel mill. Uh, in uh, in response, in return for um, export of Iranian gas, and this was uh, this was publicized uh, as a symbol of now you know we Iran we're independent we're not dependent on one side or the other we can deal we'll deal with you know we're a sovereign country we can deal with uh, the Soviet Union we can deal with the United States we can deal with 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 anywhere we like. Um, and I asked an Iranian friend about this, and he said, oh, um, this was all done at the instructions of the Americans. The Americans told the Shah to do this so that he could pretend to be independent. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was, you know, that was, how, how, do you, uh, how do you deal with something like that? You really came yeah. once Once the cynicism has become so deep, um, really, there's there's almost no way out of a hole like that. Yeah, yes. Good. So, Matt, go ahead. If you have the other questions, you can summarize it. We have a lot of good questions about the JCPOA, about the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the Iran nuclear deal. Um, and they, they, they're coming from a range of different perspectives. Mm-hmm. Um, they include um, questions about whether or not the United States can re-engage Iran and the JCPOA uh, based on um, what Iranian foreign policy objectives might be. Uh, There are questions about whether or not it's appropriate for the United States to engage on the nuclear question without uh, discussing other issues such as hostage taking and and, uh, human rights issues. Um, There's also a question about whether or not the United States can um, potentially negotiate the nuclear question while also either easing sanctions or uh, contributing to some type of broader relief effort on COVID if it's not a complete release of the sanctions. So uh, I guess I'm just summarizing the, the questions we have about the JCPOA and I'm wondering what um, you think the best way forward is for uh, reviving that and addressing all the other strategic concerns on the notepad. Well, let, let me, uh, first of all, I, I like to call it the nuclear agreement. I, I, I don't call it the deal because the deal to me um, reminds me of buying a used car. You, know, you make a deal over a used car, but not, uh, th- th- this I put on a higher level. Uh, 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 a higher level. Um, let me just say a couple of things uh, um, about it. Uh, is this, um, from the from the American point of view, you know, is this a perfect agreement? Um, of course, it's not, because it is a it's a negotiation, and you know, in negotiate in a negotiation between parties, you, you don't get everything that you want. The only way you get everything you want is if you bully the other person or force the other person um, into submission. 
but that's not negotiate. The, um, that's that's not negotiation. Um, are there things that we did not uh, are not in this negotiation um, that would be good to negotiate? Of course, you mentioned you mentioned prisoners, hostage take uh, uh, um, uh, hostage taking. You could mention some other things, um, but the decision. At the time, and I think I think it was a good one, was to say, look, um, if you negotiate everything, you agree on nothing. Um, let's find what we can agree on. Now, I mentioned I mentioned being wrong a lot uh, about Iran, and I was wrong again here back in uh, two thousand nine, two thousand ten, the beginning of the. Um, first Obama administration, um, I didn't think we would ever reach an agreement on 